Hello, this is Kelsey Lopez de Victoria, and um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the health belief model and how to make it work for you. Alright, so the health belief model, what is it exactly? Well, it is a theory, which in this context means that it's a way to try to understand um, health behavior decisions. Uh, for example, health behavior, why do you brush your teeth? Or why are you choosing to eat the things that you may choose to snack on throughout the day? And uh, this theory was developed in response actually to the failure of a free tuberculosis screening program. And so these social psychologists uh, were hired by the United States Public Health Services um, and came up with a set of conditions or constructs as I'll later explain, that must be addressed in order for the individual to change their behavior. The theory was first developed in the late 1950s, but it was updated in the 1980s to include the influence of self-efficacy on behavior. And self-efficacy is the confidence you have in your ability to make that positive health change. So this is actually not the same thing as self-confidence or self-esteem. So I don't want you to get that confused, but I will go back into this construct later in the presentation. There are six constructs in the health belief model. And we're going to go ahead and go through those right now. All right, so these are our first two constructs, and uh, they address the threat that the individual perceives from the negative health outcome. So we have perceived susceptibility, am I at risk of a negative health outcome, and perceived severity, how bad would the consequences of that negative outcome actually be? So this is gonna be your scare factor. Um, just addressing only these things without any of the other constructs can actually be overkill. So it can cause a feeling of helplessness in the individual. And we do need to watch out for that for overdoing these two constructs. The second set of constructs involves the perception of whether the benefits of the health behavior outweighs the costs and the barriers of that health behavior. So we've got our perceived benefits, what can I gain by changing my behavior, and perceived barriers, what stands in the way of my behavior change. So basically this is weighing your pros and your cons, and everyone occasionally does this when trying to make a decision, so this goes for health decisions as well. These last two constructs are regarding whether the individual believes they can make the behavior change. So we have self-efficacy, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Do I believe that I can overcome barriers to make change? And cues to action, what will give me the motivational support needed to make that final push to change? This is the final piece of the puzzle. It's very important. You can have all the advances in the world, but if you feel like change is actually not within your realm of possibilities, you will go nowhere with that. So now we've gone through our constructs of the health belief model, uh, what it is, the basics, and we're on to speaking about how you can make this theory actually work for you. Now this is an individual theory, meaning that it can be personalized and designed for one individual. Notice how many of the constructs say perceived right there in the name. So this is a big clue that perceptions of the individual can make all the difference, meaning that it's all in your mind meaning that you can explore and attempt to understand your mindset and eventually change it, making it easier to engage in healthy behavior. But you do have to start small. So let's try looking at the health belief model as a thinking exercise to try to get your brain going on the right track. And I can show you how to do this in seven easy steps. So let's get started. All right, step one, choose your health behavior. So this will be the thing that you want to change. 
And now in order to personalize and specialize uh, these thought exercises, you have to choose a specific, clearly defined health behavior to focus on. That means it must be a doable action plus a time constraint. So as we see in the examples, be more active is a vague goal to focus on, it's too broad. But saying I want to go walking 30 minutes a day is actually something that's doable and it can be measured. So we're going to go ahead and use that as our health behavior example for the rest of this exercise. Okay, step two. Assess your perceived vulnerability or susceptibility. So this is addressing how much you feel at risk of something bad happening with your health if you don't change your behavior. Again, to make this work for you, it must be personalized. So in the example, family and genetic background is being used to show that the individual is at risk if they don't change. Step three, assess your perceived severity. So how bad can it really get? Maybe you feel like there's a chance that if you don't change your behavior, you'll have something bad happen with your health. But you want to know how bad is it really? Should I really care if I don't change and this bad outcome happens with me? Well, in this example, low physical activity can lead to heart disease or cancer. So yes, the consequences could be very severe if I don't change this behavior. Step four. Assess your perceived benefits. So this is the goodies. This is what's in it for me. I really like this construct because there's always new research coming up about how engaging in one healthy behavior can lead to improvements in other areas. You'll find that once the body or mind becomes adjusted and used to a new positive behavior, it becomes easier to stay on the track. In this example, I read that regular physical activity can increase your mental performance, so that gets me all excited about making the change, and I want to get into the habit of walking to get my blood pumping, and then doing some studying. Step five, assess your perceived barriers. These are what you might call your excuses. The I'm too tired, or I don't have time to add that into my schedule, I'm too busy, etc. But this is not to say that all uh, perceived barriers are just excuses. It might be that you don't have a safe neighborhood to go walking in, and uh, you aren't able to get access to a track or a gym. And in this case, maybe doing another form of physical activity could be the solution for that. But you can't start figuring out solutions until you identify those problems or barriers. So for this example, I didn't think I had time to add in my walks every day, but then I sat down with my planner and there you go, I found a bit of time to work that into my schedule. But I never would have known that if I just said that I felt like I was too busy and left it at that. Okay, step six, increase your self-efficacy. So now we've moved through your perceptions of threat, your perceptions of your pros and your cons, and here we are at self-efficacy. Your belief that you can go through with this change and make it a part of your life. This may seem like simple willpower or motivation, but it's more tied with what you personally think will make it possible for you to succeed with this change. It could be that your family is your support system and that helps you believe that you can change, or you might set up a really cool reminder system uh, personally, I like to use post-it notes, but of course with technology these days, there's all kinds of cool ways to make effective reminder system, and maybe that gives you the confidence that you can make the change. In this example, even something as simple as doing positive self-affirmations in the mirror has been shown to promote health behavior change. The theory behind this says that the reason this works is because being asked to change or confronting the need to change goes against the positive image that our human egos like to project. So to do well in the world, we have to believe that we're adaptively and morally adequate. Making a change possibly challenges this established view. So doing self-affirmations, you know, saying things like, I am an honest and caring person, 
or recalling acts of forgiveness and kindness, that reestablishes the positive view. So it actually helps uh, set the tone for your health behavior change. Okay, finally, we've got step seven, discover your cue to action. So this is that final push that really gets you started on your plan for behavior change. This can be a famous musician that you admire coming out on a campaign and saying, you know what, I quit smoking and I'm proud of my change. Or, as we have in the example, using the buddy system is a great way to include an aspect of accountability and the social support can serve as your cue to take action. So that's it, seven easy steps for making the health belief model work for you. I hope that you learned something useful here and thank you so much for tuning in.